Uh, dear honored speaker, uh, dear guests that watching us online, my name is Roman, and uh, today I'm a moderator uh, of our uh, chat. It is a second day of Ukrainian International Criminal Justice Week, and our special guest today is Sir Howard Morrison, a distinguished British lawyer who, from uh, 2011 to 2021, was uh, one of six judge of the ICC, International Criminal Court, in Hague. Also, currently, he is the president of the appeal division of ICC. Previously, Mr. Morrison worked at the International Criminal Tribunal for Rwanda and International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia. He had more than 40 years of uh, legal career in uh, uh, as an advocate in judiciary and in uh, 2015, he was knighted by Her Majesty Queen Elizabeth II as the knight commander of the Order of St. Michael and St. George. And uh, on my behalf, on behalf of the Center for Civil Liberties, we are truly honored to have you with us uh, today. Thank you, and the floor is yours. Well, thank you, and that's, that's very kind. Um, uh, just one correction, I'm no longer a judge of the appeals division of the ICC. I, I retired from that, although I'm doing so much other things that retirement is some, just an illusion. I'm, I'm not really retired. Um, but what I want to do to talk about today is the crime of aggression as it affects Ukraine and how we can perhaps put something into place to make that a reality a prosecution for the crime of aggression. Um, it's extraordinary that since the Russian invasion of Ukraine on 24th of February, the machinery of the international legal order has been activated in a way that uh, I haven't seen before. Um, um, and the speed with which things were done was quite extraordinary. Uh, only four days later, the International Criminal Court prosecutor, Karim Khan, began investigating war crimes. Now, although neither, as you know, neither Ukraine nor Russia is a full party to the Rome Statute, Ukraine uh, submitted to the jurisdiction of, of the ICC in 2014 and has extended that submission uh, indefinitely. Uh, Russia is not a member of the ICC and frankly never will be. Um, not a realistic proposition. Um, the problem with that is the wording of the Rome Statute itself that requires that before a, a person can be, because remember the ICC doesn't prosecute states, it prosecutes individuals. Um, but before an individual could be prosecuted, they have to come uh, from a state which is a member of the Assembly of State Parties, i.e. a state that has ratified the Rome Statute. And for that reason, the ICC does not have uh, jurisdiction over the crime of aggression uh, committed by the Russians. Now, that's a great pity, but to, um, to change that would require amending the Rome Statute, which is a long and complex process and it might not happen. So the, the sensible and more pragmatic way to look at the problem is to see what the alternatives are. The, the leading proposal at the moment is to establish an international or hybrid tribunal uh, under the joint auspices of Ukraine and the UN General Assembly. Um, that would be required to uh, have the capacity uh, to avoid any raising of head of state immunity, but that's been done before. Um, and uh, it's a, an arrangement that would have to be consistent with Ukrainian law. Um, and while the Ukrainian constitution, as I understand it, bear in mind, I, I'm obviously not a Ukrainian constitutional lawyer. Um, while the Ukrainian constitution would permit the Ukrainian government 
to enter an agreement to create a, a new court, there are two important uh, conditions that would have to be met. First, the court must be international, that is not a hybrid or a, an extraordinary chambers of a domestic court. Uh, secondly, it must not be designed or described as complementary to the judicial system um, of the Ukraine. But those conditions are not in any sense fatal to the idea, and they leave ample room, in my view, for establishing a tribunal with a solid uh, and proper legal foundation. Um, Article 125 of the Ukrainian Constitution states specifically the establishment of an extraordinary and special court shall not be permitted. And I suspect, although I'm not sure, that that was a reference to the special court for Sierra Leone um, or, the, um, uh, or the extraordinary chambers in the court of Cambodia. But I think that it's more likely to be rooted in Ukraine's status um, as a post-Soviet state. Um, and uh, because the constitution goes back to 1996. Um, and the uh, idea of a special court or tribunal uh, was something that brought bad memories of the Soviet days. So I think that's the, the more likely reason why the, the constitution is so worded and understandably so, understandably so. Um, the consensus, as I understand it, about um, uh, among legal jurists in Ukraine is that Article 125 sets up a prohibition on creating special and extraordinary courts within the system of courts in Ukraine, and therefore does not place a limit on genuinely international judicial institutions. Um, so I, I think we could move ahead on this. Now, um, I'm a great believer in everybody who, who can joining the International Criminal Court, um, and have full status as a member of the Assembly of State Parties. I know that there is some reservation in Ukraine among some people who think that that might increase the chances of Ukrainian military coming before the International Criminal Court. Similar arguments have been raised in the United States. It's not actually the case. First and foremost, the, um, the ICC is a complementary court. It, it gives primacy to domestic courts. Secondly, um, uh, the ICC in respect of Ukraine already has the powers under the submissions that were made since uh, uh, 2014 to investigate any crimes committed on Ukrainian territory by Russians or uh, even by Ukrainian forces. Um, and as a jurist and, uh, and, and seeing the picture as a whole, of course, if it's the case that crimes have been committed, they should be investigated. Although the realistic position must be that um, any crimes that might or might be alleged to have been committed by Ukrainian forces fall into a very, very, very small category compared to the crimes we can see that have been committed by the Russian military forces. So it's a, it, it's, it's, it's more of a, a moral imperative than something that's going to take a great deal of uh, effort because there won't be that many cases. But a new court must also not be complementary to the judicial um, uh, system of Ukraine. Um, so it would have to be a genuinely separate court. Um, and I think the, the answer is that we've got to go back to the General Assembly of the United Nations um, and have a, a very specifically, genuinely international court with international staff, international judges, well represented by Ukrainian nationals, um, but um, not to be seen in any sense as being a, as it were, a some sort of faux um, uh, domestic court that, uh, with an international flag attached to it. It has to be the genuine article. So um, 
uh, Ukraine is, of course, a, a party to the International Convention on Human Rights, and that expressly provides that the European Court of Human Rights may deal with uh, a matter only after all domestic remedies have been exhausted. Uh, and unlike the Rome Statute, the EHCR is consistent with the Constitution. So um, there, are, uh, there are enough external factors working on the Ukrainian judicial system uh, to make it comfortable for Ukraine and for Ukrainian lawyers to see the uh, uh, to see the setup of such a body uh, that would have the effect, of course, um, of uh, uh, adjudicating things which have happened on Ukrainian soil and to Ukrainian citizens um, without it in any sense um, interfering with the sovereignty of Ukraine or being in any sense contrary to the constitution of Ukraine. Um, now, the, the problem is time scale and cost, location and staffing. The idea of setting up a, an, an international court to deal with the crime of aggression is a very uh, attractive one. But you can't be blind to the realistic problems that are involved. I suspect, although absolutely no evidence, I just suspect this. I suspect that the Dutch would be very happy that such a court should be set up in The Hague. They have been very gracious hosts uh, to a large number of international courts and institutions and have been very helpful in providing premises and providing uh, uh, all the necessary diplomatic assistance uh, that, that would be required to, for people to travel to and from the Netherlands in those circumstances. So I, I would have thought for myself that The Hague was a, uh, an ideal venue. I can even think of a building. The Special Tribunal for um, Lebanon has uh, recently finished its work. That was a building that was originally the headquarters building of the Dutch intelligence services. It's a very secure building. It even has an internal email system. Um, and it would be a very easy court to protect, um, both physically and from a cyber point of view. That's important because if such a court was set up, you can be certain that the Russians would make strenuous efforts to interfere with it. Um, uh, physically, uh, electronically, and, and perhaps even with members of the staff. So this is something that has to be considered. There would be a, a pr pretty massive security implication. Um, there would have to be a political will to provide the costs. Um, I've been involved in the Special Tribunal for Lebanon, the International Criminal Tribunal for former Yugoslavia and the ICC. And believe me, one of the ongoing problems every year is budget. Um, it sounds venal, uh, it, it, but it's, it's terribly important. Um, and it provides all sorts of debate and, and argument and disagreement between different factions. If you're going to set up a court like this, you have to take a deep breath and say, this is going to be an expensive undertaking and we are going to have to pay what it costs um, and not be spending endless hours arguing about budgetary um, uh, finery. Um, it needs to be set up with goodwill um, and the political will for it to succeed. And that means funding it properly. It also has to be a uh, staffed properly. Um, that does not mean simply taking people from other institutions who may have experience of international courts and tribunals, but none of whom will have dealt with the crime of aggression in the way that it would need to be dealt with in this court. This would be breaking new ground for lawyers, administrators and judges alike. And so there would have to be a comprehensive training program, uh, a very careful recruitment program, some people would need positive security vetting because of the sensitivity of what they were doing. Um, and that's not something that happens overnight or in the short term. So it would take a while. Um, and my argument would be 
that it needed to be endowed with uh, Chapter 7 powers under the, under the uh, UN Charter, if that were possible. Why do I say that? Well, experience showed us. I, I was a judge at the uh, uh, Yugoslav Tribunal, and on numerous occasions we invoked the Chapter 7 powers of that tribunal uh, to ensure that uh, states cooperated with the, the cases and supplied the tribunal with the intelligence and information and evidence that it needed. And I have to say that in my experience, all states did, some more enthusiastically than others, but at the end of the day, everybody who was asked to cooperate, including Russia, did cooperate and did provide the information that was asked for. The ICC does not have Chapter 7 powers. It's not a United Nations court. The ICC depends exclusively upon mature state cooperation, and it does not always get it. Uh, we can see many examples of that. Sadly, it doesn't even get it from some of the people, some of the states who are members of the Assembly of States parties. So while you might think it's not very strange that a non-party state may be reluctant to cooperate with the court. It's extraordinary that a party state shows reluctance to cooperate when this is a treaty-based court. And you have to remember that Article 27 of the Vienna Convention on Treaties states that uh, domestic uh, legislation or laws cannot override treaty obligations. Uh, and so everyone who signed up for the court should feel themselves obliged and mandated to cooperate with the court. And when you look at the trouble that the ICC has had in certain cases, you can see the importance of that Chapter 7 powers, and I think it would be a, a vital ingredient for any such new court. You would have to recruit um, experienced judges, not people who've been prosecutors or diplomats, frankly, people who've, who've worked at, the, at what I would say the sharp end of criminal judging in a senior position, and preferably for many years. Um, you would have to recruit a, a, a substantial body of interpreters and translators. Now, don't underestimate the cost of that. It's an expensive business. Um, it's one of the a major expense at the ICC, and it was a major expense at the Yugoslav and Rwanda courts as well. Um, and if it started now, if you put all of the things into, into motion today or tomorrow, um, my estimate would be it would take till the middle of next year to see anything really progressing um, towards being a functioning court of some description. It can be done, but it is going to take massive political will. And there are still those, those states who are not sure whether or not uh, it, it's an effective way forward. There are some states who think that the crime of aggression ought to be dealt with purely domestically in the Ukrainian courts um, by virtue of the consequences of the crime of aggression as much as the, the, the crime itself. Um, and there are those who, uh, uh, who are simply against the expansion of uh, any further or new uh, ad hoc or uh, specialized courts or tribunals. So there's a lot of political and jurisprudential debating going on on that. Um, I hope that that will be resolved in favor of producing such a court. Um, it's a court that I, I signed the original paper that was floated uh, in the United Kingdom in support of such a court, and I have remained a supporter of it, although I am, as you've heard, not at all blind to the very real difficulties uh, and, and problems that that uh, will arise. Um, now, I, I think, um, it wouldn't be complimentary to um, uh, uh, Ukrainian courts, it would be auxiliary. Um, so there would be no constitutional uh, impediment or any need to change the Ukrainian constitution. Um, and uh, if you simply said that it, it was an auxiliary court, it was a court that ran um, on parallel tracks, not on the same tracks as, uh, as uh, Ukrainian courts, I think that is a perfectly proper lawful uh, and uh, um, intellectually sound a way around it. 
Um, of course, we can have domestic prosecutions in the Ukrainian courts. That has happened. That will continue to happen in respect of war crimes and uh, further along the line, larger crimes against humanity. Um, the, genocide is a thorny issue, which I, I, I won't deal with in the short time I've got available. There have certainly been comments made in the uh, Soviet parliament, which are capable of amounting to um, incitement to genocide. Um, but I, I would say, as a, as a lawyer who's defended and judged in genocide cases, that we have not yet reached a situation where one could say that there is an, a, an ongoing genocidal act. Um, that's a fluid situation, and, and my view on that could change, and the, the facts will change on the ground. But at the moment, there are people talking, dangerous talk, about Ukraine not being a, a proper state, about you know, um, it always being, as it were, part of a broader Russian um, uh, territory. Um, uh, and we can go back to 1932 and see how the Soviet Union um, dealt with Ukraine um, in the genocide, and it was a genocide in my, in my, my view, in 1932. That perspective, although that's going back many years, in some ways has not changed. I don't think, and this is purely my personal view, this is not a political statement, or it's not a judicial statement, purely a personal view, having been lived through the, the Cold War and, the, and, the, and the, the, the activities of the Soviet Union, I, I, I don't personally think that much has changed. And the people at the top have changed, the names have changed, but I don't think the overall aims of uh, ultra-nationalist Russians have changed since 1945 and perhaps even since 1930. Um, um, I don't mean that in a denigrating way. Uh, there was lots to say against it, but I, I just think that is a realistic assessment of the, the culture and the approach that uh, uh, the Russian people uh, through their leadership have taken since the time of Stalin and up to the present day. They're not alone in that. Other states have done just the same when we've seen, we saw it happen in, the, in Germany in the 1930s and 1940s. Um, we see it happening in other states uh, even today. Any state which has a one party uh, system with very limited opportunities for genuine De democratic change and with ultra nationalist elements is always uh, likely to uh, follow broadly similar approaches to uh, both internal and external policies. So I, I, I don't think there's anything new or strange about that. What, what we need to do is to recognize that there isn't an enormous difference between uh, the pre-1991 Soviet Union and the post-1991 Russia. Um, but a lot of people in politics and in the intelligence services and in the military are, are bright, young, active people. That's, it. That's wonderful. But they don't have that sort of institutional memory of those days to be able to recognize uh, those problems. I'm, a, I'm an old man and I do recognize them. And uh, I lived in West Germany when it was a divided country. So I saw it at first hand. But, um, you can have domestic prosecutions in Ukrainian courts um, under Article 437, planning, preparation, and waging of an aggressive war, um, conducting aggressive war or aggressive military operations. And it's therefore a special grave crime against Ukraine and is a punishing, uh, punishable according to the Criminal Code of Ukraine, even if it's committed outside the country by a foreigner. But in this case, it would be one that was uh, that's planned outside the country, but committed within the territory and sovereign nation of, um, uh, of Ukraine. Um, there could be drawbacks to relying entirely upon the Ukrainian courts, um, uh, and um, because it's a question of capacity, uh, and it's also requires specific and careful training of the judges and lawyers involved in those cases in the same way that you require specific and careful training 
for the judges and lawyers involved in investigations of war crimes in Ukraine. As you know, I was the advisor to the Ukrainian prosecutor, General Irina Venediktova, until she was recently removed, um, which I personally find um, uh, a retrograde step and, 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 and depressing from my perspective, because we were working extremely well together. And I don't know what the future may, may bring for that. Um, but um, there is also a uh, national courts may run into significant legal difficulties due to the um, head of state um, immunities for senior Russian officials in a way that an international court would not. Um, so um, it's a possibility that you could create an international tribunal solely by the UN General Assembly without a formal agreement between the UN and Ukraine. And the argument for that is that Russian aggression is not simply an offence against Ukraine, but an affront to the entire international legal order. Um, while the crime of aggression has plainly occurred on Ukrainian soil and territory, and the Ukrainians are the ones who have suffered horribly, uh, Russia's flagrant violation of the prohibition on the use of force uh, contained in Article 2.4 of the UN Charter fundamentally threatens international peace and security. And we can see that it has. The, the, the world um, not has Europe, not only has Europe changed, but the world had changed. Um, and an international criminal tribunal with jurisdiction over the crime of aggression alone poses, in my view, little or no risk of infringing on Ukrainian sovereignty. And I would presume, uh, though I may be wrong, would find no objection by the Ukrainian uh, government or by Ukrainian politicians. Um, some have raised concern that creating an independent ad hoc court could exceed the powers of the General Assembly, um, uh, because when the General Assembly has been involved in the creation of prior ad hoc tribunals, including the Cambodia Tribunal, uh, it's been with the involvement of the target state. But uh, these are all problems which can be resolved uh, by diplomatic agreement and by um, legal analysis and manoeuvring. Um, the architecture of international law is a fluid uh, concept. It needs to be because we're going to have to change international law to encompass environmental crimes in the future in a way that we failed to do so so far. And that sort of change of architecture uh, it, it shows us that things need to be done and they need to start to be done now because the time scale between thinking about it and getting something done is always long. The former British Prime Minister Gordon Brown and several other heads of state uh, thought it would be a good idea to create a special tribunal modeled on the Nuremberg uh, uh, International Military Tribunal that would be established by a group of uh, supportive states. The, there is an advantage in that, in, in my view. It would be likely to avoid uh, constitutional issues um, because it would not require agreements with uh, uh, a Ukrainian government, but um, it may not have the legitimacy of one that was more broadly uh, created or constructed under the auspices of an international organization. And we must remember that although Nuremberg was in many ways inevitable and a success, it, it did draw the criticism of Victor's justice um, and also um, internal criticism, that not so much in Nuremberg, but in Tokyo, both the Dutch judge and the Indian judge, judge um, Judge Rawlings and, and Judge um, uh, uh, Powell um, uh, objected to the court on the basis that it was riding roughshed over the, um, uh, over the conventional guarantees of due process in a fair trial. There is one other possibility that um, has been proposed by a, an international lawyer that I know well, Kevin John Heller, would be to establish a hybrid tribunal under the auspices of the Council of Europe, um, which might be called an extraordinary Ukrainian chamber for aggression, because uh, Ukraine is, of course, already a member of the Council of Europe. Um, uh, it, would pre it might take advantage of the uh, 
the Council of Europe's approval of the existing, um, sorry, of the um, uh, of the Ukrainians' uh, approval of the existing uh, institution, uh, Council of Europe institution, the European Court of Human Rights. Um, but th there may be some constitutional issues, and and, and I, I I would regard uh, a Council of Europe tribunal as, frankly, uh, probably a, a last resort, and one that would probably create as many ju jurisprudential problems as it might solve. So I, I, I personally, um, and I may be wrong about that, but I personally would not go down that route. Um, uh, having been involved in the ad hoc tribunals and the ICC for something like 23, 24 years and seeing the problems which have arisen and which still arise, um, setting up a court where you can foresee those problems already may not be a, uh, the brightest or best idea. Um, so, I mean, in, in, in conclusion, because I'm, I've, I've I've run out of time and I try to be accurate on time. The, the, the reality is that not since uh, the years following on from World War II has the international community so been so united so quickly in condemnation of a legal and an aggressive war. That gives me a great deal of confidence that there is a way forward, um, not only by continuing to try uh, crimes under Ukrainian law, war crimes and crimes against humanity in Ukraine by Ukrainian courts, utilizing Ukrainian judges and lawyers, but also that the, the, the matrix can be extended to the international sphere. Um, it, it, has to be, it has to be done. Um, if Russia gets away with this, the danger is, in my view, uh, there'll be a domino effect and it will uh, likely try the same sort of aggressive activity uh, on other territories. And perhaps the only thing that will mitigate against that um, is membership of NATO, uh, but that's a, that's a whole separate issue. Anyway, I hope what I've said has been of some use and interest. Um, and um, if we have time, I'd be happy to answer any questions that I could Yes, talk. yes. Um, thank you, sir. Uh, first of all, we are grateful for your time, your commitment and dedication in your work aimed at the development of international criminal justice, peace and uh, rule of law. Uh, for me personally and my colleagues, and we are working in Kiev, Ukraine, it is a unique opportunity to get first-hand experience with the conversation of a person of your um, scale. And if I may, we receive uh, three questions uh, during live broadcast, and uh, I would like you uh, to answer them, and I will read them aloud for people to hear it. Uh, first question, how does security service of such future court will work? Is it any national security service or court-owned service? Who can hire such officers? What guarantees do we have not to get Russian spies uh, between those people? And I mean ICC or a future ad hoc court? Well, that's a good question. Um, let's, let's take as an example, supposing a court was set up in, in the Netherlands, in Holland, then primacy would be given to the Dutch security services uh, because they, of course, have a sovereign right to deal with security issues on their own territory. But I have no doubt that being the pragmatists that the Dutch are, uh, that they would seek assistance um, from uh, other interested security parties and create a, a, a matrix of intelligence gathering which would uh, help uh, to protect the court. Um, it would involve a quasi-military force. I mean, there are. If you go into the the Yugoslav Tribunal or the uh, the Lebanese Tribunal or the ICC, we we have many armed guards both around and within the court building itself, um, and that would, of course, be a very necessary step. Uh, the, it's never possible to insulate any organisation from infiltration by spies. History has shown us that. But um, the, the best guarantee that you can have is a very strict uh, positive vetting of all staff. Um, it's much easier these days to trace the activities of people through 
the internet, through social media, um, through their connections with their schools and colleges and previous work, um, and, and see if there's any activity which would cause uh, suspicion or alarm. Um, positive vetting is, a, is it's something that will slow down the creation of a court because it can't be done overnight. Positive vetting takes weeks, if not months, um, and is a highly specialised um, procedure. But it would have to be done um, in those cases for those people who had access to um, the most sensitive of information and material. It may not be necessary for everybody in the building, and it will be done on a case-by-case -case basis. Yes, thank you. And um, the second question is uh, a little bit theoretical one. Does crime of aggression exist only in the situation of AYAK, international armed conflict, meaning uh, war between two th independent nations? Well, as we understand it, that is the crime of aggression. It's an international armed conflict. It's a situation where one state invades the territory of another state um, illegally, unlawfully, without lawful excuse uh, in order to pursue some form of foreign policy um, or simply to gain territory. Um, and so, yes, it would normally be an international armed conflict. One of the difficulties that has, has dogged the, uh, the ICC on the crime of aggression is the fact that international courts and tribunals are set up to try individuals, not states. And therefore the crime, the people who commit the crime of aggression are inevitably the people who are at the top of the power base um, in any country. Those are the ones who direct and control the military forces of that state. And in the last analysis, uh, if you have a supreme commander, that, that's the person um, who, uh, if the supreme commander has the power to direct the activities of the armed forces and to order them to go into another territory, um, then that is the person you would be looking at. And then of course, you interface with the potential problems of head of state immunity that domestic courts might face, but international courts do not face or need not face. Um, but uh, and the short answer to the question is yes, it, it's the crime of aggression is fundamentally based upon the concept of a, an international armed conflict. Um, yes, uh, thank you. And our last question uh, display uh, criticism uh, to UN security system. Uh, will UN make the same mistakes with Ukraine and Syria as League of Nations did uh, during italo ethiopian war and during uh, Japan invasion of China? Yeah, I mean, I, I am, I'm a huge supporter of the United Nations in principle. In practice, uh, there have been very big mistakes that have been made. Um, one could argue that the ad hoc tribunals for Rwanda and for the former Yugoslavia were set up by the United Nations in order to try and make up for the fundamental mistakes that it made in those two territories. In Rwanda, by not supplying more troops at a time when the head of the UNIMIR forces in Rwanda, General Romeo Dallaire, a French Canadian general, asked specifically for more forces because his human intelligence showed him that something nasty was about to happen and the UN failed to act. Um, and in the case of Yugoslavia, the, um, the so-called safe haven of Srebrenica, which was guarded by um, a, a UN contingent of um, conscript soldiers from the, from the Netherlands, who were no match, were never going to be any match for the professional Serbian army. <coughs> and so the, those were, in my view, and in the view of many people, fundamental uh, mistakes by the United Nations. And I would agree with the analysis in respect of, um, um, partly uh, in respect of Syria. But we have to remember that the, the, the work of UN forces in a, in a hostile territory is extraordinarily difficult. Um, and uh, uh, they are never given the overall support that they genuinely need. And while I, I do not um, 
seek to excuse uh, mistakes, I can understand why they are made um, and why, um, as it were, human failings, even in a large body like the United Nations, inevitably occur. Um, the, the thing, as with all human endeavors, is let's learn by our mistakes and try to prevent it from happening again. And that's, that, that harks back to what I said about Russia and the, and the worry of future aggression by Russia. The West did not react strongly and properly in respect of Crimea. Um, uh, I, of that, I am personally very, very, very certain. Um, that was a mistake. Um, we are seeing the results of that mistake. Thank you, sure. I um, agree with uh, your uh, wording and uh, uh, we, you answer all our question. Uh, let's uh, continue our work to fight for more just world, to fight for international criminal uh, justice. And uh, today our um, event is officially over. Thank you again for being with us. Thank you for your time and your assessment on the present uh, situation in Ukraine and uh, on a future uh, possible uh, tribunal for prosecution of uh, Russian military aggression against Ukraine. Thank you, sir. Thank you, and please everybody be safe. And I hope that your families are safe. And I would very much like to see you all one day in Kiev. Of course, we are doing our best. Thank you.